Welcome, welcome to episode number four of the Green Revolution with Micah Dewey. Today we're going to be taking a look at three different things today. We're going to be looking at COVID and COVID cases and what we've been dealing with here in Manitoba and throughout Canada. Secondly, we'll go over certain Green Party issues that have come up, um, including the re-election of James Bedorn in Manitoba as the leader, PEI Greens parking versus busing. Uh, we have Annamie Paul seemingly showing some issues in polling. And then a couple other Manitoba-specific issues as far as green development and funds that were given by the federal government that have yet to be spent. Finally, I'm going to be adding a new segment to this show that is a personal uh, passion of mine, which is uh, racing. And what better place to bring in Formula E? Um, If you were unaware of Formula E, Formula E is the uh, FIA World Championship that involves electric vehicles rather than uh, gas-powered internal combustion engines with turbos like Formula One. So I'm going to be going over uh, the initial start of the season, an intro to the championship, a 2021 driver lineup in case there's any names on there that you may or may not know, some news regarding it, and some some bad news and some almost good news. So let's, uh, let's just get started with uh, COVID as far as Manitoba is concerned and maybe the most disgraceful, I don't know what you would call it, interview or his, uh, well, let's just watch it. It, it was <laughs> um, Brian Palliser, the premier of Manitoba, has been having terrible press in the last few weeks, uh, the last month and a half or so. And it's been getting worse and worse and worse. They haven't been doing shit about it. And you might notice a theme throughout this episode that's basically Brian Pallister doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. And he had this to say. And it's it's about a two-minute clip, but I think the entire thing is important to listen to just because I think without it, we might actually lose some of the value or... Uh, message that he's trying to send. So let's just listen to Brian Pallister talking about the COVID pa- uh, COVID pandemic and what you should know and what you should not do and his crazy analysis of 99% of Manitobans. So let's, let's just listen. The surge in positive COVID cases in the Winnipeg region is concerning for all of us. And We are doing everything we can to help halt the spread of this virus and protect our most vulnerable Manitobans. And that is job one. So we're just going to stop there real quick. Job one, eh? (laughs) Job one is to stop the spread, but you haven't done shit about it. COVID numbers are rising, and it's not due to a lack of awareness of the issue on the part of the people of Manitoba. Most people in Manitoba, 99%, I'll say, have been behaving responsibly. Uh, that's probably true, 99%, but it's also not true because in the last month, we've had at least four or five anti-mask rallies and only one of them have actually had RCMP or Winnipeg police show up at the event. And only one of those events, the one that it was in my hometown of Steinbeck, actually had any arrests and actually had any like legitimate fines, like over the $1,000 mark. So... You can say that 99% of people are doing what they should be doing, but it's not really the point. The point is that those there should be crackdowns on anybody doing any of this bullshit. They've been behaving in a thoughtful manner, in a considerate manner. All, uh, almost all Manitobans have been making sacrifices through this very challenging time, this unprecedented time. Yeah, see, Brian, we wouldn't have to be making unmitigated sacrifices if it wasn't for your government's failure to provide any policy that was actionable at all. Unfortunately, your lack of leadership in this pandemic is so wide open and so open for scrutiny that 
you're just now taking that upon yourself and which you know i guess is a responsible thing to do but like we don't really want a responsible premier right now we want we want a competent one and you are not that but the number of people infected in the lower age category has been steadily increasing and significantly so uh, we also know there's a greater likelihood of uh, the dangers now of group gatherings with social people and group gatherings are a danger uh, as a consequence of our red rules uh, group gatherings and orange rules group group gatherings of over five people are restricted Yes, but you're still making all these kids go to school. Oh, wait, we'll get to that in a minute. And that means there's a rule against that, so don't do it. Yep. There's a rule against it, but it's only it's literally only enforced in Winnipeg because they have their own police force that can actually enforce it. Outside of the city, nobody gives a shit. Like, there are... I think I went to the store yesterday, and there were a dozen people walking around without masks on in the store. And because nobody's going to say shit about it because nobody wants to get assaulted at Walmart. Like, there has to be really strict penalties for this shit. Yes, we're stepping up enforcement. Yes, we need to be proactive. Yes, we need to be preventative in our decision making. And so I also want Manitoban's perspectives on another initiative that's been taken in other jurisdictions around the world. It's been taken actually in Manitoba as well and we are giving serious consideration to it and as with all of our plans we make them available to Manitobans for feedback before they're implemented I want to do the same with this one we're giving serious consideration to implementing a curfew a curfew that would be designed to restrict travel between key hours when gathering sizes tend to be dangerously in excess of the rules all right so curfews are I don't, I don't really give a shit one way or the other, except for the fact that I work overnight. So I don't know how the fuck they're going to make that work when there's a ton of people in the in the building coming to and from. I'm sure that there will be work, uh, work like exceptions, but I could see this going totally wrong. And the other thing is, if you're not enforcing your mask mandate, how the fuck are you going to enforce a curfew, Brian? How are you going to do that? You're not. You're just saying things at this point to make it think make us think that you know what you're doing. You don't. You're just you're asking the public what we what you should do. This is not what a competent leader does. Make your own goddamn decisions and go forward with it. Jesus Christ. Late night hours, obviously. These late night situations in Winnipeg have expanded our number of COVID cases very significantly, according to Dr. Rusin. This is an action that we should seriously consider, and I am seriously considering it now. I want Manitobans to tell us what they think of the idea of a limited period curfew. We hope very short time period is involved here, but this potential measure will need to be acted upon. If Manitobans can support it and encourage it, good. If they disagree with it, I want to hear from you too. Nobody's going to agree with this because they know that you can't enforce it. Now, I just want to find one other clip real quick, and I feel really dumb because I didn't actually pull it up before. But let me just see if I can find it real quick. Pallister crying. Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Video, video, video. Where's... Here it is. Uh, okay. I will do what I believe is right. And right now we need to save lives. If you don't think that COVID's real, Right now, you're an idiot. You need to understand. Yeah, you're a fucking idiot if you, don't, if you don't think it's real. But at the same time, this government hasn't shown that they think it's a real threat, so... ...stand that we're all in this together. You cannot fail to understand this. Stay apart. So I'm the guy who has to tell you to stay apart at Christmas and in the holiday season you celebrate with your faith or without your faith that you celebrate with normally with friends and with family that where you share memories and build memories I'm that guy and I'll say that because it will keep you safe I'm the guy who's stealing Christmas 
<laughs> See, Brian, if you wouldn't have fucked up in, in August and September, you wouldn't have to be the one that stole Christmas. Yeah, we probably would still have a second wave. Let's be honest. Yeah, we would probably still have it. We have a lot of fucking idiots here that don't think COVID's real. Even people I work with in the healthcare industry do not think COVID is real in Manitoba. That's how fucking stupid people are here sometimes. These are also the people that are generally very religious. In my experience, at least around here. So, you think they're going to give a shit what you say? I really, really want this to end. And I'm sure you do too. So why don't you just step down and let somebody else with better leadership skills, better decision making, better, you know, long-term vision for the province take over because as we'll see later in this episode you've made not just one mistake you've made dozens upon dozens upon dozens of mistakes that keep on coming back and killing people so please this is the only time i'm going to ask nicely mr mr premier please step down take a vacation go to costa rica don't come back just leave. We don't want you here. We don't need you here. Let somebody else take over. Because this is... This has gone on long enough. And your poor decision making has led to the death of hundreds. Either indirectly or directly. I'm not going to say which one. But... The lack of leadership coming from this conservative government at the moment is so out of left field, so far from the norm, but yet they try to, they try to show that they have this deep burning desire to make things right, but yet at the same time, they don't care. They're not, they, they didn't close shit down until a month after it was too late. They aren't even putting schools uh, on lockdown until after Christmas. Why? Well, <laughs> because then people would have to, you know, find daycare in the next week. Which, again, is a failure of your government by not having a universal daycare or childcare plan. There are a lot of issues here. But you're kind of the you're kind of the catalyst for all of this. So please resign and we can move on to somebody else who might have some chance of leading this province out of this disaster. Because as I'll look at in a few minutes, our our case rates, our death rates, and our test positivity rate are insane. Okay? So um, we'll go over to the teacher thing real quick. So man, uh, Winnipeg teachers to get rapid COVID-19 testing, a new pilot program after a holiday break. Uh, news comes as data shows c cases in school have doubled more than, uh, doubled since November 17th. That is, uh, two weeks, guys. <laughs> two weeks. We've had doubled, doubling of cases in two weeks. Um, the other insane part of this. So, the rapid testing pilot will begin in January and will coincide with the post-holiday return to school. These tests will be part of a broader expansion of rapid testing throughout the province. The province has sent in a $40 million order to Songbird high-risk tests, which will help deliver 45,000 tests a month. This is great. But it should have been done in April. We wouldn't have these issues with schools and closings and reopenings and closings and all of this again if you would have just done your job when you could have instead of trying to be all, you know, I, I, we can't spend money, we can't spend money, blah, 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 because that's how this has been going for the last six months. Private citizens in the United States have been able to get have been able to get rapid tests since April. And you're saying that the province couldn't get them until January? 
come on, man. I'm sure I could, you know, I'm sure we can find some rapid test online right now. COVID rapid test for sale. Can we get a, can we get one? Uh, da, 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 da. Hey, look at that. You can buy a COVID antibody test for $423. Obviously that's expensive. Obviously, but um, <laughs> come on, man. Really? It took me two minutes to find, uh, two seconds to find them. Oh, this is 25 tests, so it's $16 a test. Yeah, why the fuck haven't you bought this? Oh, because you have to go through some bullshit. Well, we now have a 10 year old that's dead because of this and because of your failure to, you know, keep on doing this. The youngest uh, COVID-19 death in Manitoba is a child under 10, caught it at school. Uh, current five day COVID-19 positivity rate at the time of this paper, which was, I think Monday, right? Yeah, Monday was 14.2% uh, and 13.9% in Winnipeg. Uh, this child died in Winnipeg. Um, and you know, if, if we're looking at Brian Pallister crying about canceling Christmas, but still can't see that this is a problem. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I think it's just too late at this point. I don't really know what else we can do about this. Um, yeah, cool. So grade 7 to 12 in Manitoba will move to remote learning after holiday break for two weeks. Again, they're delaying it and delaying it for economic reasons. And it's just, if you think it's a big deal, which it is, and if you think that things are going to go wrong, hey, look, it's Kelvin Gertzen doing this bullshit. Of course. So this is the guy that wants homeschooling for everybody, not public school. He wants homeschooling for everybody. He's the fucking education minister. How the hell does that happen? I mean, he was also on a call with Betsy DeVos and an actual Nazi from Germany. So, I mean, like publicly. So, I mean, if you want to be associated with Trump and the AFD in Germany, then I mean, that's up to you. Um, one really great resource for anybody who lives in Manitoba that I want to sh shout out, especially if you have kids, is uh, the Twitter account at COVID School. Um, this person does a tracks and dashboards um, all of the Manitoba K to 12 school exposures. Um, they will, uh, you know, add to the list daily basically um, of note at least 17 school district divisions had uh, pro professional development days on November 20th two days before a drop in cases 39 on the 23rd probably less than the age group that went for testing on the PD day hmm. the only other day below 50 cases for this age group was on Tuesday the 17th so they're on they're averaging you know, significantly over 50 cases a day. It's probably about right here, like about 60, 60 cases ish per day for just students and teachers. Like, come on guys. And we know we can just look at this graph. This date was two days after they didn't have any school. This date was also two days after they didn't have any school. Hmm. We should probably not have school right now. eh? like, come on guys, please. I should probably follow that shit. Um, oh, yeah. And then the government exposure website also kind of went down. So they don't really want people to know. Uh, two days of no updates. Last letter for Winnipeg was December 2nd. Uh, letter posted on December 3rd. Other regions up days. 955 cases tracked now, which is well below the 1566 that the CBC announced on December 4th. So they're not 100% accurate. 
but they do get almost every every major outbreak that's not directly reported by CBC or Global. So it's an important um, it's an important uh, resource for Manitobans and Manitoban parents, especially, to just keep an eye on. Does your school have an outbreak? Have they not told you? Have you know? Have they not told uh, the actual administrators yet? Has the school division not closed your school yet? Because I know that that's at least the case with one of them in Steinbeck. Woodlawn School has not shut down, even though I think they have 17 cases right now. Come on, guys. It's an elementary school. Shut it down. All right. Now, let us just let me just pull up my numbers here. I, I, I looked them all up before. So as of right now, uh, this is uh, December 6th at about 4 a.m., the total numbers as far as Manitoba is concerned, as far as COVID, we have a total of 381 deaths. On Saturday, we had 354 new cases and a total of 9,115 active cases and a 13.1 five-day rolling average on the test, uh, test positivity rate, 13.1%. That's, uh, that's roughly where New York was at the, at the height of the pandemic back in like March and April. And if we just look at per capita, we're not doing much better than New York right now. Um, and that was considered like the biggest disaster in North America. Because our population is, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3 million, somewhere in there. Our 380 deaths don't look like it's that big. But if we 10 times that and we're at 3000 deaths because of population, that all of a sudden becomes like, whoa, what the fuck is going on? Just for a comparison here, um, Canada-wide, we've had a total of 12,589 deaths and 6,352 new cases as of Saturday and 70,518 active cases. But the nationwide test positivity rate is only 3.3%. And we're about a third ish like just over like 31 percent of people were tested per 1 million which is pretty good um there were a total 93 deaths today or yesterday i guess and it's really concerning that um as far as like Stories about these people that have been dying and stories about the families that have been affected. They just they just don't matter anymore in the mainstream news. I think I've seen like this. There, I've seen two stories in the last week and they haven't been specific like this one about the 10 year old. It doesn't tell you anything about them. That's that's literally the entire that's the entire story. Manitoba public health officials advise of 10 additional deaths due to COVID, including a boy under the age of 10 from Winnipeg. There is, uh, there's nothing else about him. And that's fucking sad, dude. You know, it's, um, our government, our local media has kind of failed us here we're not we're not bringing attention to these people that are dying and it's really sad so i want to move on to something that's a little bit more exciting and you know it it lets us think about what leadership can actually mean and I just want to talk about now we're going to go into Green Party stuff and different green developments across Canada and in Manitoba specifically for this first one. And I just want to give a shout out to James Badom. Uh, he was he was reelected as the Manitoba Green Party leader. Um, he has been party leader for 12 years and was elected to another two year term on Monday or I guess Saturday. And he's a good guy. Um, he almost won a seat last time in, in Wolseley and it was pretty close. I think it was about like 
six to seven percent. Like it wasn't it wasn't close close, but it was pretty close. Considering that no Green Party member has ever actually been elected in Manitoba, and that he was within like reaching distance of uh, a cabinet minister is really really good. And I think that in the next election, whenever that happens, hopefully, well, it won't happen anytime soon. It'll probably be on the four-year term because we have um, a majority conservative government led by Mr. Pallister. And I think that if we see any movement whatsoever, it'll probably be a NDP slash green swing here in Manitoba. And I hope that we can, I hope that the Greens can take at least a seat or two. I hope James wins his seat next time. And I hope we can get at least one more. That would be great. If we could get two seats next, next, uh, next election, that would be great. Considering we've never had any and James was really, really close last time. And I think, you know, when, when you hear him speak and you, when you hear, um, his uh, his motivations. It's it's kind of hard not to want to vote for him, even if you don't live in his riding. Um, unfortunately, I didn't at the time. I actually did after the election. I lived like right across the street from the Green Party uh, headquarters in in Winnipeg. But um, yeah, no, I moved a little bit too late to vote in that into in his riding, so I had to vote here in Steinbeck against somebody who won 83 percent of their votes so it was uh <clears throat> it's a it's a big it's a big deal that we have a that we have a good leader and i think um i, I rarely say anything good about liberals but in manitoba Dougal lamont is actually a very good leader um they're kind of a third. They're kind of the third party in Manitoba, though. The NDP is more of the second party, so there's less. Uh, there's less reason for the liberals to like be excited about it. There, there is a possibility of like a liberal NDP um, opposition, like a minority next next election, but I doubt it. Um, it's either going to go NDP full or conservative majority like there's rarely uh there's rarely a mix here and i think that we are probably if it's if there was an election today i think that the conservatives lose by a landslide just based on how poorly they have done on everything um all right so let's move on from james to something a little bit weird and a little bit interesting in in pei so um charlottetown residents um, have been offered free parking and the Green Party in, in PEI is uh, is just kind of confused I guess <laughs> and I, I completely agree um, PEI Green Party is suggesting the government did not go far enough with an initiative to encourage shopping in downtown Charlottetown oh yeah they're in a bubble and they've been basically COVID free for like months now so good job PEI um, earlier in this week, the city announced parking would be free in December. That initiative was supported financially by the provincial government. Green MLA Steve Howard rose the que rose in question period Wednesday to ask the premier why the plan only benefits people with cars. Which, in a city, yeah, that's a that's a that's a fair question to ask. Uh, many Charlottetown residents will not be able to make use of this initiative because they rely on public transit to get around. He asked if Premier Dennis King would be willing to make a uh, similar commitment to provide free transit. King responded that the idea came up in discussions with the mayor and he was willing to support it, but he did not rule out expanding on the idea. So that's good. Um, it's a good point raised by the honorable member, he said. If there's a further extension to what we can to what we can help to encourage others to shop downtown throughout transit, Mr. Speaker, I'd be very open to that. So... Um, King said that we had to have to look at the cost of free transit, adding that the province already provides financial support for transit in Charlestown. Yeah, I mean, most most provinces do. I think Manitoba does too a little bit. Not very much, but um, yeah, I mean, if you can... If, if you have open shopping right now, which must be nice. Um, kind of want to move to PEI now. Uh, if you have open shopping... Uh, and you're offering free parking when you normally charge for parking offering free transit when you normally charge for transit would also make sense especially because it's more economical i mean buses don't generally park 
at the mall or on Main Street most places. So like they're not taking up a parking spot. They're just dropping people off. That makes way more sense. Honestly, it makes more sense to provide free transit than it does to provide free parking. But hey, you know, I mean, they're trying to they're trying to stimulate the economy and I think that they did a good job. The problem is is that in a city at least I feel like busing is more important than parking for the majority of people not everybody actually maybe not the majority probably a minority I guess parking is probably better if you had to choose one I know I would prefer parking even though the busing is also important if I was still living in the city and they gave the option I would take the busing yeah so I understand I understand why this is kind of weird um, one final one actually no we got two more stories here as far as um, green and green party adjacent issues uh, we're gonna talk about anime Paul real quick and I have I was I was in support of Dimitri Lascaris and the Green Party uh, leadership race I did not like anime that much um, as far as a politician she's a great person but as far as her policy positions they were a little bit wishy-washy for the most part and that's not to say that like she doesn't have good ideas she definitely has good ideas they're just not quite as far left as I would like and I think that that's a fair you know that's a fair criticism to make of a federal leader even if they don't like it that's 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 something I'm going to stick with and you know polling shows greens are no further ahead than they were two months ago yeah because I think she's made one public statement in two months like other than like two green party members directly like she's not in parliament she ran as an she ran in Toronto Center barely lost again it was pretty close it was like seven or eight points considering that last time she had six percent in that riding so I mean that's a I think she ended up with like 38 or 39 percent so it was closer than I think most people expected I even did an ad for her and I think that like as much as people try to like the first line is about her identity and I think that that is it's an important factor but I don't think that that's why people aren't excited about her or are excited about her I think they're excited about her or not excited about her because of her policies and lack or lack thereof and in the last episode I praised her because she did a great job in coming back at Trudeau about him expanding on pipelines and terrible just policy environmental policy and i gave her all the credit she deserved and it was a lot it was the best thing that she's done since she's been leader but that's really about all she's done since she's been leader and that video doesn't have that many views it's only like 2,000 views or something like that so people don't really know about her i would i would guess <clears throat> that if you asked <clears throat> a random canadian who is somewhat affiliate like somewhat knowledgeable on politics but not like a hardcore person like i am or maybe like you are if you're listening to this i feel like if you asked one of those one of those canadians who the leader of the green party of canada is i would guess that most people would still say elizabeth may or maybe even paul manley um not Annamie Paul because she hasn't been a public figure yet. She hasn't been out there. Like, unless if you're deep inside this Green Party apparatus, you don't really know who who she is. Other than maybe you've seen the headline. Like, if, if you know who she is, you probably saw the headline saying, Oh, look, we have a we have our first black permanent leader of a federal party, which is great. I'm not saying that that is not a good thing. That is absolutely amazing. However, policy gets people's emotion, not identity generally, at least in my experience from what I've talked to people and what I've seen from other people, um, policy is generally more important. And, you know, I think it's, um, I think it's an important factor, but I don't think it's like the end all and be all, you know, if she was, it let's just if she was a white woman with the exact same uh policies 
I don't I don't really know what I don't I don't know what the what the it wouldn't really be that big of a deal. Like our policies aren't that exciting or or even that radical for a green, for like what's supposed to be our farthest left party in Canada. They're not really that radical, honestly. You know, like she's against the she's against TPP, she's against the the pipelines. Like these are all things that most green adjacent people would would be. Um, so, you know, it's just a little it's just a little bit uh yeah, so Abacus Data found a poll, uh, did a poll that 29% of Canadians had a strong enough view of Paul to either to form a, uh, to form either a positive or a neg negative impression of her. Those opinions are split down the middle. 15% positive, 14% negative. Exactly. Like she's a 29, a 32% they had said a, a neutral opinion, and 40% and they, they didn't know who she was. So 40% don't even know who you are, and you're the leader of a national party. I don't know, man. Like, all this other stuff is just kind of irrelevant. Like, again, we would like Anime to have a seat. Absolutely. We would like her to be in Parliament. Absolutely. We would like her to be, you know, arguing with Jagme and, and, and Aaron and Justin and, and the French dude. I, I can't remember his name now. Um, Eve oh, Blanchett. I can't remember his first name. Eves, I think. Uh, so, like, we want we want her in there to be actually making her, her voice heard. But until she wins a seat, it's not going to happen. So, I don't know what happens here if, like, in the next election or in the next by, uh, runoff that she enters and she doesn't win. What happens then? Like, what if it's not even close? What if she ends up with, like, 15%? What do we do? What do Greens do? Because if your leader can't win a seat, that's pretty bad. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Let's move on from this. I, I don't want to be too negative because, again, this is this was her first like foray into politics. She won the leadership race. She's only run. I guess I guess she did run in Toronto Center previously, with little success at all. And now, and then in the most recent one, she ended up with 38%. So, I mean, that is, that is progress. And I think that there is a chance that, you know, she becomes the face of, you know, leftist parties in Canada. But until that happens, it's just really kind of, it's, it's NDP or nothing right now. Because, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to move on from this. It, 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 it's just not very motivating. Um... This one, oh, I need to pull up, I need to open up my lap, uh, my iPad here because I had uh, notes written about this article and I don't really want to read it all out. So, um, Manitoba green development experts are calling for energy policy changes. And this is actually a really big change if it actually goes through. Um, so, my notes here say um, that they're calling for... Um, use of embodied carbon in building materials, including wood and cellulose. What that means is that it will pull carbon out of the air, which is really cool. Um, we're also looking at more geothermal solutions, which has been gaining, uh, gaining advancement here in the last little while. Um, and then, but the problem is natural gas deliveries in Manitoba are increasing year on year, and we have maybe the best hydro system or like electric uh, water generated power plants in North America, but yet we're bringing in more LNG. So like, because some houses still only run on LNG, they don't run on um, hydro, which is what they're calling for. They're calling for the, for the government to spend $4 billion to, to basically fit uh, Winnipeg's houses, about 60% of them are not on hydro or electric he heating right now. So they're looking to spend, f they want to spend $4 billion to completely transition away from LNG over the next five years. That's really, really impressive. And only $4 billion, like that's not much for the, the province. That is quite a bit for the city. But... 
Um, yeah, converting all of the electric heated homes in Winnipeg would cost less than $4 billion, he said, which is about 60% of the cost to build the key, uh, kiosk dam in northern Manitoba. This would produce... Uh, this would also reduce the demand for peak energy, but not having transport, not having to transport the energy and storing it on location. Exactly. Um, uh, one of the problems with natural gas is that we're installing new gas pipelines right now. The pipelines are typically amortized over eighty to eighty-five years, so they don't pay for themselves until like long, long after you're dead. And the fact that we just keep pushing in that direction is just really silly. And. Uh, they're going to reconvene in, at the end of January to try to put this forward. Um, this is done by Efficiency Manitoba, and I think it's a. Um, I think it's it's we're moving in the right direction. Um, basically, the end of this is just uh, we've we've actually got all natural gas deliveries in Manitoba increasing by uh, increasing every year. Essentially, the opposite of what we're discussing here today. All panelists acknowledge the initial cost of transitioning away from the natural gas, but all the energy solutions presented would save Manitobans money in the long term. And that's all that really matters. We don't really need to be spending money on on pipelines and natural gas that doesn't even pay for itself for another 80 years. And that's assuming that, you know, natural gas still exists in 80 years, right? Like, like we can actually still get it. <laughs> and... If you're going to build, like, building pipelines right now doesn't make any sense whatsoever, especially when we have such affordable uh, methods to, to transition. Um, uh, we're still stuck in the 1950s in terms of how we build our single-family dwellings. This transition is achievable on a mass scale if we decide to do it. Exactly. So that's, that's the thing. It, it really is going to come down to who is holding government because right now with Pallister and uh, and the conservatives they're not going to do this shit unless if their buddies can make four billion bucks if their buddies can make four billion bucks then they might do it make a make us look like the green uh, capital of the world and then just be like actually we're going to we're going to do this it's going to cost us five billion but we're going to do it we're going to give uh, these contracts to our friends honestly at this point I would be okay with that if they were if they were going to be like you know what we 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 think we can do it for five but we have to do it with manitoba owned companies sure go for it bro as long as all this stuff is taken care of we're no longer you know trying to get natural gas and new pipelines built in manitoba then yeah fuck it i don't care give your buddies all the money honestly i, I think that's actually a good thing you should be we should actually be um recommending not corruption, but like, you know, if you're keeping the money in Manitoba to a Manitoba, Manitoba owned business to fix Manitoba housing so that Manitoba doesn't have to spend billions of dollars on natural gas, I don't know. I think it's a win, 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 win with a slight loss if you are super, super political about it. So I, 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 I think that that's probably the way that I would, I would present it to them because they're a bunch of scum lords, but hey, you know, maybe we can use that for, for positiveness. Yeah? Okay. Um, and again, kind of like the reverse to that, which is even weirder, <clears throat> is that, um, so when the carbon tax got implemented and there was a big argument between Manitoba and Saskatchewan and the federal government on... I guess Alberta was in on that too. About we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. We already we already invest enough. Blah 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 blah. Well, in exchange for that, they were given sixty-seven million dollars to combat climate change in Manitoba, the Pallister government. And they have spent less than they have spent less than nine percent of that money in two years. So my notes that I've got written down here basically um, say that we've. We've spent 5.9 million of the 67 million given from the federal government on one project. That one project was in cutting emissions in the trucking sector, and there was a single project in two years that cost 5.9 million dollars. Now, if you have 
four billion or five billion dollars and you can kind of just spend as you feel like i said in the last one if we're going to transition all these homes into um hydro and electric uh ready houses to do that through your own friends and family and blah 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 that's fine um but as we see from uh the ndp uh environment critic uh, Lisa Naylor, she says that it sounds like these projects are stuck in cabinet. Um, and then, you know, uh, the Minister of Conservation and Climate, Silla, uh, Sarah Golomard, said the province is, in, is discussing the funds timelines to ensure 60, the $67 million is spent. Yeah, but it's been two years, dude. <laughs> um, provincial government is sent, is said it's offering 2.1 million dollars in rebates truckers committed to full fuel efficient retrofits which basically means that if you buy something from one of our dealers to fix your truck to make it more uh energy efficient blah 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 then we'll give you a refund a, a partial refund um uh, so far 5.9 million of federal cash has been dedicated to retrofits fuel saving devices and technologies within the tr uh, trucking sector the effort is pegged to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 150,000 tons, which is not insignificant. That is quite a bit. Um, it took roughly 14 months for Manitoba uh, to sign on to Ottawa's climate change plan. So they wanted to cut emissions by one megaton between 2018 and 2022. Um, but that's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> Manitoba surprisingly abandoned its $25 per ton carbon tax plan that fall saying, after saying so Ottawa was given the province no credit for the green investments that it already made. Because you're not really doing any green investments. All right, let's take a look at the most important or the most exciting green investment right now. And this is where I get a little bit crazy because I love racing. I love uh, following all of this. And... Um, Let's just take a quick look. So I want to play just a few minutes of the highlights from last year's Formula E season. And just kind of as an intro, if you're watching the video, you can take a look. If not, you can also check the video out on YouTube. I will leave the link for this uh, highlights of the season um, in the description of this podcast so you can take a look at it if you want it's really fun so let's just jump into this thing real quick so this is highlights of the season so far this was about halfway through i believe yeah okay just into second place on the final lap it's a brave one to go around the outside to the outside lovely move Whoa. we go green in Diria. very quick lights out I love how those cars sound. Sims comes over, covers the inside line. Max has happened in that two pack D. Go FIA race control saying attack mode activation zone now open. Blue lights flashing. Here's Bird round the outside of Nick de Vries. So Bird goes through into third position. He's got 30 seconds left and is Van Dorn going to use his attack? Uh, his fan boost here, Van Dorn covers the inside, Bird gets the inside though, Van Dorn's laying on the brace, and he's going up the inside of Sims, they make contact, and Bird is through, no. no, not quite, but Van Dorn is in the lead now, Sims drops behind him, so now it's Bird in second, Sims in third, as Robin French sends it on the inside of Maxi Gunther, wow. A reminder, Van Dorn still has to use his attack mode, and Bird's his... there though, no attack mode to be aboard. A board attack mode is the message to Van Dorn. He's but going, going, he's going. Anyway, up the inside into the chicane. Birds into the it's lead. It's a sweet the move. There's Roland up the inside. Sims tries to close the door. Bit too late. Roland's in a bit deep, but he gets the job done. Roland up into fourth. Sims drops down to fifth. And there was a time. The strategy in this is so fascinating with attack mode because there was a time that Sims looked to have no worries. No, he had. All right, yeah, so this is maybe, it's not the, it's it's definitely the most exciting uh, 
motorsport right now. Um, the tracks are really tight. The races are like 45, 50 minutes, so they're not super, super long and drawn out. They're pretty exciting. You know, you have, uh, you know, 24 or 26 cars, I think it might be this year. I'll double check that. I believe it's 26 this year. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 20. Okay, 24. Oh, it says right there. Um, yeah, so 24 cars. And there has been some news coming out about Formula E and the future. So let's just look at um, let's just look at the teams and drivers real quick, and I'll read out what we know so far. The season doesn't start for another month or so, so th and there's still one seat open. So we'll see who that ends up being. Um, so 20, 24 cars, 24 drivers, 12 teams. This is the first year that the Formula E Championship is a FIA World Championship offering the most uh, super license points, which means that if you are successful in Formula E, you could go on to Formula One or vice versa. They're kind of being, it's, it's kind of being presented at this point as not a second tier championship, but as a 1A and 1B, even though it's not quite there yet. It's pretty close, but it's not quite there yet. So especially with some of these most recent um, announcements. So let's just read that one real quick. So the most recent announcement is that BMW and Audi are, are quitting uh, after the end of the 2021 season, which is kind of, that's kind of bad. Um, the good news is, is that Tesla and Volkswagen are kind of interested in taking those spots. So if that happens, then great. Um, but losing two major companies like BMW and Audi is kind of, especially when they've been there since the very beginning of 2014, it's, uh, it's not great, but they're, they've kind of been looking at it. BMW is very smart with motorsports. They wouldn't be quitting if they thought that they could make money or thought that they could expand their brand which is kind of understandable, but it's also depressing because you know then that the development of these cars for racing hasn't really transitioned as much. I mean, obviously it's, it's, it's pushing development forward, which is good, but it's not doing it quickly enough for BMW who thinks that they can spend the money that they're spending in Formula E just more efficiently. So, and I guess that's, prob that's probably true, right? Like. A lot of the money you're spending is on drivers and on, on transit and in transportation. That's just a lot of money. Like if you're going from Chile to Saudi Arabia, to Marrakesh, to New York, like that's that's a lot of flying and transporting of materials and that's not cheap. I can guarantee you that. So, um, but they did announce, BMW did announce that um, they are going to be releasing a new fully ev architecture vehicle first one since the i3 back in 24 15 14 or 15 i believe it was 15. uh it's, it's their first new car that is built completely on an ev system rather than a plug-in hybrid system they're expecting it to cost about seventy-five thousand euros slash ninety thousand us dollars so that's uh that's an expensive car but it's um you know i'm sure it'll be awesome they're always like that so let's just look at the drivers real quick and we can talk about uh, a few of them. So Audi, we've got Lucas Degrassi, Rene Rast. Uh, Degrassi is a former champion. Um, BMW, we've got Max Gunter, Jake Dennis. I don't know who Jake Dennis is. He's new. Uh, Max Gunter won a couple races last year. BMW is dropping out, so we don't really know what's going to happen with these two guys. And I guess these two as well, Rast and Degrassi, because Rast is an Audi uh like an Audi driver. He's not necessarily a Formula E driver. This is his first full-time year, I believe. I think he spent like half the season last year in F F uh, Formula E after um, they dropped uh, Apt. So um, Penske, Dragon, we got Sergio Sede Camera, Formula, Formula 2, Formula 3. Uh, he's also raced in uh, Super Formula. And we don't know who his teammate is yet. That's the only one that we do not know who the team teammate is. Uh, former uh, last year's champion Antonio Felix da Costa and team championship Diaz de Cheetah with John Egg Vern. John Egg Vern, former, uh, former Formula One driver. Uh, Antonio Felix da Costa is 
I believe he drove in touring cars, the World World Touring Car Championship, and I think Le Mans as well. Um, in Vision of Virgin, we have Robin Frines, Nick Cassidy, who is I think my favorite for the uh, for the championship this year. He he's done very well in Super Formula and in uh, Super GT. Uh, he did very well in F3. Um, you know, there's a very good chance that he wins this championship this year, is assuming that Virgin doesn't have any major issues, which they have had in the past. Uh, Mahindra, Indian company. Um, we got Alexander Sims and Alexander Lin. The Alexes, uh, they're both decent. You know, Mahindra will probably do all right. Mercedes EQ, which is uh, a stacked team. Basically, we got Stoffel Van Dorn and Nick DeVries. Nick DeVries was 2019's Formula 2 champion. He spent a little bit of time in... Uh, in he, he spent all last year in FE. And then Van Dorn was also a former Formula 1 driver and former um, F, uh, Formula 2 champion, as well as the test driver and reserve driver for the F1 Mercedes team with Lewis Hamilton and Valtteri Bottas right now. So, you know, that's a <laughs> that team is pretty stacked. Uh, Neo has Oliver Turvey and Tom Blomquist. Tom, I believe, was a former uh, World Touring Car champion. And Turvey is kind of a... He's a... Um, what's the word? Journeyman. He's, he, he kind of drives wherever. Uh, we have Nissan Edams. Edams is one of the most... Or Dams is one of the most uh, successful non-F1 teams. Um, they have won championships in literally everything. Uh, they got Sebastian Buemi, who is um, a Le Mans winner, F1 former driver, and Oliver Rowland, who finished, I believe, second last uh, in the previous season to... Uh, where'd he go? Where'd he go? Where'd he go? To DeFries. I believe he was second place in, that champion, in the F2 championship. Uh, we got Jaguar with Mitch Evans and Sam Bird. Sam Bird moved over from Envision, who... They both won a couple races last year. That that team will be pretty successful. Uh, we have Tagauer Porsche with Andre Lauder and Pascal Verlein. Again, former F1, former Le Mans winner. I, a lot of these guys are really, really good drivers. Uh, looks like for Rocket Venturi, we've got Eduardo Matara and Norman Nato. I don't know who that is. That's a new. That's a new guy. So we have <clears throat> we have three three new drivers this year. Jake Dennis. Uh, Tom Blom, I think Blomquist might have driven one or two races last year. Um, so Nato, Cassidy, and Dennis, and then maybe Blomquist. I think he drove a couple races. He's dri he's definitely driven a couple races in the past for Formula E, but I don't remember exactly which ones. But yeah, I mean, so we've got this starting up. I will be trying to cover all of the fun information about this series. It's really fun. It's really exciting. And it's something that I think that we can talk about that's positive because I think when we're looking at things from a <clears throat> left green uh, socialist perspective, there's not really that many things that we can just enjoy and go, this is good for the environment. This is good for, you know, society as a, as a whole. There's very few things that normally come out that way. And I think that Formula E, despite being very corporate and very uh, expensive, I guess you could say. Um, it's also a way for automotives, for the communities around these teams, ABB, we've got, um, ABB is the title sponsor, they're very big into electrics. Um, and if we can get, if we can get somebody like Tesla or, you know, I mean, Tesla's basically the biggest name that's not in the lineup right now. And after BMW and uh, Audi leave next year, there will be two spots open. My guess is Tesla maybe takes that, maybe takes one of those two spots. And then the other one, who knows, it might be a third party team with, uh, with c components kind of like Envision or Penske does right now. So, um, I think in the future I will be covering this a little bit more and I will probably come up with more segments. We can maybe do a get to know the drivers thing. You know, I'm, 
I might even send out some emails to see if we can get any of them to come on because that would be really cool to, to talk to one of these guys about what it's actually like to um, to race in a series like this that actually has some like significantly positive um, positive outlooks um, Lucas Degrassi, the, one of the drivers for Audi, uh, made a very, very good video last year. Let me just find it real quick, and I'll link that as well. Um, it was about, he lives in, let's see, Degrassi. Climate uh, change. Let's see, this one, let's see. This isn't the one, but there's there's a longer. Um, he did like a thirty minute documentary about like uh, climate conditions in India and Monaco and Brazil. And he's Brazilian and he lives in Monaco. And I guess uh, he has friends and stuff from from India. So I think that it's a um, it's a uh, very interesting. Uh, video to watch and unfortunately I can't seem to find it right now which makes me feel really bad um, but if I find it before I'm done I will uh, I will add it to the description below so um, if you enjoyed this episode of the show I hope you did um, I kind of put a little bit more effort into this than I normally do and uh, if you made it all the way through to the end please make sure to leave a five star rating Leave me a comment, send me an email. All this info will be in the description of the podcast itself. And just let me know what you think. Um, I also have a Patreon that uh, if you enjoyed my work and you want to see anything else that I do, I also write and uh, provide content for different locations. The, all that stuff generally gets posted in its raw form on my Patreon and on Substack. So if you're interested, the Patreon is patreon.com backslash Mike to Dewey, and um, I'll leave the Substack uh, stuff in the description as well. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for coming and listening. And if you have any comments, please just send me a message. All right. Thank you, and have a fantastic week. And stay safe, wear a mask, and solidarity to all y'all. Bye.